Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star of Lily back there. And as always, I'd like to remind you to please stay safe and healthy. Hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. Today we are going to get back into Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. We are going to read the summary analysis of uh, part three, Marius, uh, chapters, uh, books one through four. And, okay, the chapter begins at Paris and... Chapter 1, Paris in Microcosm. The chapter begins with a meditation on the Paris street urchin, a type of person unique to the city. The street urchin is a small, grubby child who earns a bit of money by performing chores for the people of the city. He is dressed poorly but often attends theatrical performances. These children are dissol uh, dissolute and mischievous but also unspoiled. They, they are a symbol of France, which has all the elegance and wonder of the world along with all the barbarians. Around eight years after Cosette and Valjean settled into the convent, one of these little street urchins, a boy of about 11, who goes by the name of Gavroche, wanders about the streets of Paris. He's bright, playful, mischievous, but he's also poorly dressed and a bit sad. His parents are still alive, but they neglected him horribly. They treat him badly. It's just terrible. They, you know, they don't love him. Still, he decides to one day to visit in their ramshackle apartment where, where they live with his two older sisters. Father's goes by the name John Drat, but there is good reason to think that this is not his true name. The wretched family, wretched family lives next to a young man named Marius. Chapter 2, A Grand Bourgeois. An eccentric old gentleman named Monsieur Gillenormand Man lives on the fraction of his family's fortune that remains after the revolution and his wife's financial mismanagement. He is a quirky man, fond of the theater and luxury, making a grand statement. He has some strange habits. For example, he renames his servants based on their location of origin and pays a barber to shave him daily. He is a monarchist supporting the <clears throat> divine right of kings, an opinion that has become outdated in this new democratic age. Uh, so I think uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was was mon monarchist. It seemed like that's what he you know went for. He's especially fond of women in his old age. One of his former maids named La Magnon delivered a baby in a basket due to his basket to his doorstep, claiming that he was the father. Yellow man chuckled about this and saw it as an affirmation of his virility, but he was not pleased when a second son arrived. He finally agreed to pay. La Magnon, 80 francs per month for the maintenance of the two boys, provided that she would leave him alone but allow him to visit his sons every, once every six months. Monjour Gillenormand had two wives, now deceased, who bore him two daughters. The older of these daughters is a practical-minded woman who never married and is known as Mademoiselle Gillenormand. She lives with her father, and they have a difficult but loving relationship. The younger was a sweet, romantic girl, who died young, but not before bearing Monjour Gillenormand, a grandson, who was called Marius. Monjour Gillenormand treats the young man somewhat gruffly, but adores him. And then, uh, chapter three, or book three. Gillenormand and grandfather and son, excuse me. Monjour Gillenormand spends much of his time in a pre-loyalist salon discussing the wretched young revolutionaries and uh, reminiscing about the glories of the enlightened, uh, excuse me, of the 18th century. He refers to his absent son-in-law, the husband of his deceased younger daughter, and the father of Marius, as the Brigand of Loire. In fact, this brigand, who was named Gerogius Pontmercy, was a member of Napoleon's army and the veteran of a number of battles. Napoleon himself named him a baron and a colonel, but this was this war hero lives out, out his life in the quiet town of Vernon, subsisting on a small military stipend and spending most of his time tending his garden. Monjour Gillenormand man dislikes him because of his political beliefs and persuades, persuaded him to give up custody of his son Marius by threatening to disinherit the little boy. Georges did not want his son to grow up in poverty, so he accepted Gillenormand's man's strict terms. He never visits his son and writes him letters on major holidays that go unread. Desperate to catch sight of his son, Georges visits the little church that Marius attends with his aunt and gazes at the boy from behind a pillar. 
A gentle-hearted church warden, Monsieur Mabeuf, Mabeuf, catches sight of him, and Georges tearfully explains the situation. The two men become close friends. When Georges is on his deathbed, he calls for his son Marius to visit him. Marius survives too late. His father has just died. Georges left his son a little son a letter, which explains how he wanted his son to adopt the title of Baron that Napoleon awarded him at Waterloo. <coughs> Georges also asks his son to find the man who saved his life at Waterloo. A man by the name of Thenardier who runs an inn in Montfermeil. Marius returns home thinking little of his father's wishes. Marius goes to the church as he always does at St. Solspice. He sits down behind a pillar for mass, but is interrupted by, by a church warden who says that this is his favorite seat. The church warden, who is Monsieur Mabeuf, explained that he loves his the seat because this is where a father used to catch a glimpse of, glim, glimpse of his beloved son whom he was debarred by his family from ever, ever seeing. Mabouf notes that the man's name is Pont Mercy. Marius turns pale, realizing that this was his father. Marius had always thought his father had heartlessly abandoned him, but now he knows that this, his father risked everything for even a glimpse of him. Filled with love for his father, Marius reads every book he can about the battles that George has fought in and visits as many of his father's friends as possible. He even tries to find Thenardier, but the inn has been shut down and the family has moved on. Marius spends so much time doing this that his grandfather, Gillen O'Man, thinks he must be seeing a woman. Marius also begins to read political philosophy and eventually comes about to adopt a point of view that is more favorable of the Republic, divisive towards the royalist belief that his grandfather holds dear. Putting his faith in Napoleon's new democratic order, Marius' business cards made that re read Le Baron Marius Pontmercy. Curious to find out the root of their young relative's fixation, Mademoiselle takes her handsome great-nephew Theodore, with tailing Marius join one of his mysterious excursions. Theodore discovers that Marius has gone to put flowers in the grave of his father. Theodore is so stunned by this discovery that he does not report to Mademoiselle Gillenormand. Marius' secret is discovered when his father, dis his grandfather discovers George S. Pontmercy's dying letter to his son, along with Marius' business cards proclaiming his barren status. Monsieur Gillenormand is furious at what he sees at his, his grandfather's, at, at his grandson's participation in a corrupt new political order, but. Marius def defends himself and his father. Finally, Marius is so infuriated that he screams down with the Bourbons, current, current ruling family of France, and that fat pig Louis the Eighteenth, Monsieur Gillenormand, man, kicks his grandson out of the house. Marius heads off to the Latin Quarter with only a new, few francs in his pocket. That's what some would do here in this country. They didn't support whoever they decided. Chapter 4, the A, B, C, Society, I think that's how they pronounced it. This age of political turmoil has led to the rise of a number of semi-secret political organizations where young people gather to discuss the events of the day and perhaps plan revolution. One of these is the ABC Society. Its public purpose is the education of children, but is actually a group of young students with democratic leanings. The name of the group is a pun on the French word a base underdog, which means the people like that. And Jolris is the leader of this group. He's a fierce advocate of revolution, in some ways a zealot. Combeferre is his second in command, offering a more philosophical bent to the group. Jean Prouvaire is a dedicated scholar. Fieu Lilly is a fan maker who taught himself to read and is the most in touch with the people. Corfirac is a wealthy young man who developed an interest in politics. Behorel is a young man given to violent revolutionary practices. He often mocks authority. Bousset, also known as Legal, seems to be, have constant bad luck, but he handles it with humor. Jolie is a hypochondriac studying to become a doctor. Grantaire is a ske skeptic who doubts everything, and he is not a true member of the group, but he hangs around them because of his deep admiration for Enjolras. On the af afternoon that Marius leaves his grandfather's house, he runs into Lagel, 
discovering the name, Lego explains that he once tried to cover for Marius during roll call at the university. The professor called out the names of every student in class, and an absence meant that one's name was struck from the cl class roster for the rest of the semester. Trying to be helpful, Lego called out that he was Marius Pontmercy. This saved Marius because problems were legal when his own name was called. He ended up being kicked out of the class. Marius is grateful but horrified, though Legal finds the story humorous. Korfarag joins them. He and Marius become great friends and invite Marius to a great to a gathering of the A Bay Say Society. Marius has never been in such a wonderfully liberal environment where every aspect of politics, religion, society, and life generally may be discussed. He leans much he learns much from his new companions. However, he pro he proves insufficiently liberal for his new companions. Frustrated by their criticism of Napoleon, Marius launched into a long-winded defense of the statesman. He asks, what can possibly be greater than such a man? And Combeferre quietly replies to be free, realizing he has worn out his welcome. Marius leaves. <clears throat> he does not return to the meetings of the A. B. C. Society, but he does maintain his friendship with Corferac helps to support him. Marius is in dire poverty, being still in, still a university student, and now with his, out his grandfather's fortune to support him, he sells much of his clothing and gets by on, on only a piece of bread a day. His aunt Gillenormand sends him money, but Marius returns it to her, saying he does not need it. Analysis. The first two chapters in this section are examples of the lush characterization that has made Les Miserables such a classic. In chapter one, Hugo describes the activities and characteristics of the street urchin in great detail. Using this as a launching pad to meditate on the grandeur and depravity of France in general, this summary conveys the main post of these musings and takes special note of the, their connection to the main events of the plot. Monjo Gillano man is a complex but relatable character. He is the embodiment of many 18th century values, and he is given to hyperbole and frippery, but he is also a deeply loving grandfather. However, his possessiveness of his grandson manifested, and his refusal to allow the child to have a relationship with his father ends up backfiring when the young Marius discovers that his grandfather has lied to him all his life about his father and begins to idol worship Georges, Georges Pontmercy. The schism between Marius and Gillen O'Man is one that was likely common during the time that he, Hugo wrote his novel. France at that time was struggling with the aftermath of the French Revolution. People were asking a number of complica complicated questions. What does it mean to have a democratic government? How can we alleviate poverty? Uh, I don't think anybody's ever really figured that one out yet. If you, I think the only way you can alleviate poverty is to... And this is a really tough. Um, is for all humans to become enlightened and and uh, and evolve in enlightenment. Until then, you know, greed and everything's going to keep going on, and going to keep stealing. You're going to have corrupt governments, corrupt politicians, corrupt citizens, and then there are citizens that uh, they want to be relevant, so they. You know, even if they're poor as a church mouse, they feel that the way to be relevant is to be, is to be mean. I don't know if that's you know true, but it seems to be to be, you know. If they're putting down their fellow man who has little, maybe it, it elevates them a little higher, on some sort. Of, makes no sense, you know. I mean, I wish every good for everybody. I'm not poor, but I mean, I'm not rich. I'm not. I mean, I'm doing okay, you know, but I mean, but I want everybody to be, to do okay. I mean, you know, if someone's hungry, I, you know, I want to help them and I don't want to help them so I can get kudos. I want them to, you know, eat, you know, it's like you pay it forward, you know, you help them, they help, you know, help someone else that may need it. And when people talk about that, then they, you know, I hear in the same people, in the same breath wishing, I, I don't, I don't get it. It's just me, you know, I just, just me, I guess. Okay, let's see where we are. The estrangement between grandfather and grandson also serves as 
an allegory for the politics themselves. The old century is being <coughs> challenged by the ideals of the new. However, just as Marius proved insufficiently conservative for his royalist grandfather, he is not liberal enough for his new revolutionary friends. Marius, though sometimes headstrong and impractical, is forging his own path and honoring his own beliefs. And that's the end of the summary and analysis to Marius. I could get into some of Book 5, The Excellence of Misfortune. I don't need to read too, too much, but I can read a little bit. The Excellence of Misfortune, Book 5. Subcategory 1, Marius Indignant. Life became harsh for Marius. To eat his coats and watch was nothing. He chewed the inexpressible cut of bitterness, a horrible thing which includes days without bread, sleepless nights, evenings without a candle, a hearth without a fire, weeks without labor, a future without hope, a coat out at the elbows, an old hat that makes young girls laugh, the door found shut in your face at night because you have not paid your rent, the insolence of the porter and the landlord, the jibes of neighbors, humiliations, outrage, self-respect, any drudgery acceptable, disgust, bitterness, prostration. Marius learned how one swallows all these things and how they are often the only things one has to swallow. That time of life when man has need of pride because he has need of love, he felt mocked because he was badly dressed and ridiculed because he was poor. At the age when youth swells the heart with an imperial pride, he more than once dropped his eyes to his worn-out boots and experienced the undeserved shame and poignant blushes of poverty, wonderful and terrible trial from which the feeble comes out infamous, from which the strong come out sublime, crucible into which destiny casts a man whenever she desires a scoundrel or a demigod. For there are many great deeds done in the small struggles of life. There is a determined though unseen bravery that defends itself foot by foot in the darkness against the fatal invision, invasions of necessity and dishonesty, noble and mysterious triumphs that no eye sees and no fame rewards and no flourish of triumph salutes. Life, mis uh, life misfortunes, isolation, abandonment, poverty are battlefields that have their heroes, obscure heroes sometimes greater than the illustrious heroes. Strong and rare natures are created this way. Misery, almost always a stepmother, is sometimes a mother. Privation gives birth the power of soul and mind, distresses the nurse of self-respect. Misfortune gives good milk for great souls. In Marius's life, there was a period when he swept his own hall, when he bought a penny worth of bribe in the market, when he waited for nightfall to make his way to the baker's and buy a loaf of bread, which he carried furtively to his garret as if he had stolen it. Sometimes there was seen there was seen slipping into the corner meat market in the midst of jeering co cooks who elbowed him, an awkward young man with books under his arm, who had a timid and frightful frightened appearance, and who on entering looked, took his hat off his forehead, which was dripping with sweat, made a low bow to the astonished butcher, another bow to the butcher's boy, asked for a lamb chop, paid six or seven sous for it, wrapped it up in paper, put it up in his arm between two books and went away. It was Marius on this cutlet, which he cooked himself, and li he lived three days. First day he ate the meat, second day he ate the fat, <coughs> third day he ate, gnawed the bone. Several occasions, Aunt Gillen or man made overtures and sent him the six the pistols. Marius always sent them back, saying he had, he had no need of anything. He was still in mourning for his father when the revolution scribed was achieving in his mind. Since then, he had never left off his wearing black. His clothes were slowly leaving him, however. A day came at last when he had no coat. His trousers were going also. What could he do? Corferac, for whom he had, he also had done some good turns, gave him an old coat for thirty sous. Marius had it turned by some porter or other, and it was like new. But this coat was green. Marius did not go till after nightfall, which made his coat black. So wishing to be in mourning, he clothed himself with night. Through all, through all this, he achieved admission to the bar. He was supposedly occupying Corferac's room, which was decent, and where a certain number of law books, supported and filled out by some old volumes of no 
odd volumes of novels, made up the library required by the rules. He had his mail sent to Corferat. When Marius became a lawyer, he informed his grandfather of it. In a letter that was icy but full of submission and respect, M. Gillen O'Man took up the letter with trembling hands, read it, and threw it, torn into four pieces into the wastebasket. Two or three le days later, Mademoiselle Gillen O'Man overheard her father, who was alone in his room, talking aloud. This always happened when he was very excited. She listened, the old man said, If you were not a fool, you would know that a man cannot be a baron and a lawyer at the same time. Subcategory 2, Marius Poor. Poverty is like everything else. It gradually becomes endurable. It ends by taking shape and becoming fixed. You vegetate, that is to say, you develop in some squalid way, sufficient for existence. This is how Marius Pontmercy's life was enraged, arranged. He had left the narrow, narrowest place behind. The past widened a little in front of him. By dint of hard work, courage, perseverance, and will. He had succeeded in earning from his labor about 700 francs a year. He had learned German and English thanks to Corferac, who introduced him to his friend, the publisher. Marius filled in the literary department of the bookhouse, the modest role of utility. He made out a pros prospectuses, translated articles, annotated editions, compiled biographies, etc. Net result, year in and year out, 700 francs. He lived on this. How? Not badly. <coughs> we will spell it out. An annual rent of 30 francs, Marius occupied a wretched little room in the Gorbeau building with no fireplace called a cabinet, furnished with no more than the indispensable. The furniture was his own. He gave three francs a month to the old woman who had the charge of the building for sweeping his room and bringing him every morning a little warm water, a fresh egg, and a penny loaf of bread. On this loaf and in this egg, he would breakfast. He breakfast, his breakfast, excuse me, varied from two, two to four sous, depending on the price of eggs. At six in the evening, he went down to the Rue Saint Jacques to dine at Rousseau's opposite Basset. The print dealers at the corner of the Rue des Mathurins. He ate no soup. He took a six penny plate of meal, a three penny half plate of vegetables, and a three penny dessert. With three sous of as much bread as he liked. As for wine, he drank water. On paying at the counter where Madame Rousseau was majestically seated, still plump and fresh in those days, he gave a sou to the waiter, and Madame Rousseau gave him a smile. Then he would leave. For sixteen sous, he had, smi he had a smile and a dinner. The Rousse this Rousseau restaurant, where so few bottles and so many pitchers were emptied, was more an appeasing than a restaurant. Rest, restaurant. It no longer exists. The master had a fine title. He, he was called Rousseau, Rousseau the Aquatic. Thus breakfast, four sous. Dinner, 16 sous. His food, food cost him 20 sous a day, which was 365 sous a, francs a year. And the 30 francs for his room, and the thir 36 francs of the old woman, and a few other trifling expenses, and for 400... 150 francs, Marius was fed, lodged, and waited upon. His clothes cost him 100 francs, his linen 50 francs, his laundry 50 francs. The whole did not seed 650 francs. This left him 50 francs. He was rich. He would occasionally lend 10 francs to a friend. Corferac borrowed 60 francs from him once. As for fire, having no fireplace, Marius had simplified it. Marius had al always had two complete suits, one old for every day, the other quite new for special occasions. Both were black. He had only three shirts, one he had on, another in the drawer, the third with the laundress. He replaced them as they wore out. They were usually ragged, so he buttoned his coat to the chin. For Marius to arrive at this flourishing condition had taken years, hard years and difficult ones, those to get through these decline. Marius had never given up for a single day. He had undergone everything by way of privation. He had done everything except go into debt. He gave himself this credit, that he had never owed a sou to anybody. For him a sou was, for him a debt was the beginning of slavery. He even felt that a creditor is worse than a master. For 
For master owes only you your person. A creditor owes your dignity and can belabor you that. Rather than borrow, he did not eat. He had spent many days of fasting, feeling that all ex extremes meet, and that if we do not take care, a basement of fortune may lead to baseness of soul. He watched jealousy over his pride. Such a habit or such an accident or such an ac action as, in any other condition, would have appeared deferential, seeming seemed humiliating, and he braced himself against it. He risked nothing, not wishing to take a backward step. His face had a kind of ruddy severity. He was timid to the point of rudeness. In all his trials he felt courage, and sometimes even upheld by a secret force within. The soul helps the body, and at certain moments raises it. It is the only bird that sustains its cage. Hi, Yanni. Besides his father's name, another name was graven on Marius' heart. The name of Thenardier, in his enthusiastic yet serious nature, Marius surrounded with a sort of halo, the man to whom he thought he owed his father's life, that brave sergeant who had saved the colonels in the midst of the cannonballs and bullets of Waterloo. He never separated <coughs> the memory of this man from the memory of his father, and he associated them in his veneration. It was a sort of worship with two graduations, the high altar for the colonel, the low one for Thenardier, the idea of the misfortune to which he knew that Thenardier had fallen intensified his feeling of gratitude. In Montfermeil, Marius had learned of the ruin and bankruptcy of the unlucky innkeeper. Since then, he had made untold efforts to track him down and try to reach him in that dark abyss of misery in which Thenardier had disappeared. Marius had scoured the countryside. He had been to Chelles, to Bondi, to Gournay, to Nogent, to Lagny. For three years he had devoted himself to this, spending what little money he could spare in these explorations. Nobody could give him any news of Thenardier. It was thought he had gone abroad. His creditors had sought him also with less love than Marius, but with as much zeal, and had not been able to lay their hands on him. Marius blamed and almost hated himself for not succeeding in his searches. This was the only debt the colonel had left him, and Marius had made it a point of honor to pay it. How could it be, he thought, that when my father excuse me, lay dying on the battlefield, the Nardier could find him through smoke in the grape shot and carry off him off on his shoulders, and yet he owed him nothing. While I, who owe so much to the Nardier, cannot reach him in the darkness where he is suffering and restore him in turn from death to life, Oh, I will find him, indeed, to find Thenardier. Marius would have given up one of his arms and save him from his wretchedness, while his blood to see Thenardier to render him, render some service to Thenardier to say to him, you do, not, you do not know me, but I do know you. Here I am, make what you will of me. This was Mar Marius' sweetest and most magnificent dream. Let's see what I got. I may stop just there. Uh, so much we got left in this book. Not really, well, no. let's see here. Uh, page 63. Yeah, I will finish this book in the next chapter. I mean, in the next video. But if you enjoyed this book, this uh, video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And as always, stay safe and healthy. And till next time, have a great day.